it is very similar to S-Wave, right? The, the only difference is that it, it is no longer in the same site, but in neighboring sites. So is it still S-Wave? Or let me rephrase it. Does it have to be S-Wave? No. So which other options are there? You can say any random one. So <laughs> yeah, it can be P. It can be D, it can be F, it can be G, it can be anything. So th this kind of superconducting order can be associated to any pairing symmetry. It can be, yeah, singlet, triplet, depending on what, what are the symmetry properties that it has. And the last one. So first question, can it be S? No, right? Can it be D? Uh, no, I mean, you, you have those orbit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, very good. Well, why not? Well, exactly. So this, that term is odd by definition, and, and therefore it cannot be D. So that term can be either P wave, it can be F wave, it can be H wave if it did exist and, and so forth. So any, it can be any kind of spin triplet superconductor. So the last term is odd by definition. All right, great. So now in the last part of today's, let's uh, move on to how to engineer un unconventional topological superconductors by starting from conventional topological superconductors. And to understand a little bit about topological superconductivity. Uh, let me just uh, bring up again our Nambu representation uh, for the uh, electronic excitation superconductor. So again, the idea is that we have electrons and holes, and we write down the Nambu Hamiltonian, the the Hamiltonian in terms of uh, a new matrix that uh, involves both electrons and hole degrees of freedom, and now. The very important thing to realize is that once we define this new Nambu spinner, we can actually have some excitations that can be their own antiparticles. Namely, that once we have those Nambu spinners, you may have excitations that are 50% electron and 50% hole. And therefore, when you take the dagger of them, they can be exactly the same. This doesn't mean that all the eigenstates of any superconducting Hamiltonian have this property, this just means that maybe some superconducting Hamiltonians, some of their eigenstates do have this property. And this property is what we essentially call a uh, the definition for a Majorana excitation. So a, an excitation that it's its own antiparticle. And from the mathematical point of view, what it's important to keep in mind is that Every time that you have electrons or every time that you have creation and annihilation operators, you can always rewrite them in terms of Majorana operators, in terms of operators that are their own antiparticles. So in other words, you can think that in every metal that we have in nature, in every two-dimensional material that has electrons, we already have Majorana excitations. They are just bounded to each other all the time. You can think that an electron is just two Majorana excitations bound to each other, and an anti-electron is the two major excitations bound in a slightly different way. So a linear combination of the two major excitations. So the whole idea for topological superconductors is to create superconducting orders that somehow unbound these major excitations that mathematically form electrons to leave them isolated in some part of the superconductor. So. That is essentially the idea for now. So we are going to see how we can create specific superconducting orders whose eigenfunctions, at least some of them, and in particular the ones that appear at the surfaces or at the edges, have this property of being Majorana excitations. And 
to show you how this may happen in a superconductor, let us just consider maybe the, the simplest unconventional superconductor that we can think about. So uh, to make uh, things simpler, let's think about a one-dimensional system. So just a linear chain in which we don't have spin anymore, or you can think that you just have a ferromagnetic chain in which only spin up electrons exist. And you consider superconductivity in this one-dimensional chain with ferromagnetic electrons. So the superconductivity that you have here is of course going to be spin triplet superconductivity. So you can think that this delta is delta up, up, if you think that these electrons are all up. And since it is spin triplet superconductivity, it has to be a P wave superconductor. It has to be a superconducting state that changes sign in reciprocal space. So in particular, once you take the superconducting state and you do the Fourier transform, you get a superconducting order that is sine of K, where K is momentum in reciprocal space. So this superconductor is spin triplet, one dimensional, L equal to one. And so let's say odd superconductivity. Now, the very interesting feature of this model is that it is actually exactly solvable in one limit. And in particular, if you take the limit in which the hopping and the superconducting order are exactly the same, you can transform this superconducting Hamiltonian to the new basis, which is the Majorana basis. So you just rewrite every single electron operator and every single uh, annihilation operator in terms of the Majorana operators. And what you actually find is that at the edges of the chain, there are two operators that are not coupled to anybody. So what this actually means is that at the ends of the chain, you have zero energy excitations in your superconducting state. So I think that this is easier to visualize if we just do an actual calculation. So let, let's just take first our one-dimensional uh, spin triplet superconductor. And you can do this in the afternoon, for example, by adding both exchange field and P-wave superconductivity to a one-dimensional chain. So what you actually see is that you get a full gap in your Boulogne zone. Again, here, red is electron, blue is hole. And now, if you consider a finite system, what you actually see is that you have all your bulk states that have a finite gap, but then you have a bunch of states here at zero energy that they do not have any gap at all. And no matter which perturbations you add to this Hamiltonian, you always see this zero energy mode. So these zero energy modes are the major excitations that appear in this very special type of spin triplet superconductor. So the basic idea is that in nature, it is very hard to find one-dimensional superconductors and actually impossible in practice. So if we want to create some one-dimensional unconventional superconductor, we need to engineer it somehow using certain ingredients. Now, uh, let, let me, before moving to the materials part, let me briefly emphasize that the appearance of these zero modes is related with the topological non-trivial structure of this Hamiltonian, in particular, the topologically non-trivial structure of the gap matrix. And let's say the details we will, of course, address in the lecture on Friday. All right, good. So let me move on to how to engineer this actually in nature. So let, let us just imagine that you want to engineer a one-dimensional superconductor that has a a uh, spin triplet order. And you want to do it with two dimensional materials. So a very simple way of doing this is actually the following. So uh, if, you, if you are thinking about a spinless superconductor, you can get spinless fermions in two different ways, right? You, you can just apply a Simon field and lift one of the spin degrees of freedom, or you can just use helical states. So states in which up electrons move in one direction and down electrons move in the opposite direction. And these are just two different ways of uh, getting half of your degrees of freedom. These states are the states that appear in two-dimensional quantum spin hall insulators, in particular in two-dimensional topological insulators. And as a reference, this, uh, this is the state that it's realized, for example, in one T prime tungsten dietel, right? And many other uh, yeah, T transition metal dicalcogenide allotropes. So all these materials are materials that without the distortion, they are metals, and then they have a strong distortion and through spin orbit coupling, they open a gap. 
And this gap is a topological gap that realizes a quantum spin hole insulator. But for our purpose, the only thing that we need is to know that these materials have helical states, spin up propagating one direction, spin up propagating the opposite. So now you take your two-dimensional material, so tungsten dye telluride, and what you have to do is to deposit just other two van der Waals materials here on the left and on the right. So here you deposit a magnet, and in particular, this can be chromium triiodine, chromium tribromide, chromium trichloride. It doesn't matter uh, ex uh, exactly what is the direction of the magnetization. Where it's important is that you break time reversal symmetry. And this breaking of time reversal symmetry is essentially going to gap out the helical states that you have here, because these states are protected by time reversal symmetry. And then the last thing that you have to do is to put your superconductor here on top. So for example, you can put here your naive dye selenite, for example. So if you combine this chromium tribromide, tungsten ditelluride, chromium tribromide, naive dye selenite, essentially what you realize here at the interface is a one-dimensional spin triplet superconductor with Majoran excitations here in these two corners. So in other words, you combine three different two-dimensional materials and you get a one-dimensional topological super, superconductor with major excitations. All right, so that was the idea for one-dimensional topological superconductivity. So now let me tell you how to create two-dimensional topological superconductivity. So now instead of having a topological superconductor that has, topolog that has zero modes that are zero-dimensional, we are going to think about a superconductor that has uh, one-dimensional channel, so one-dimensional Majorana's propagating. And first of all, let me just remind you that this is exactly what we saw uh, for the spin triplet superconducting order driven by interactions in the ferromagnet. So that state had H states, and those H states were essentially Majorana excitations. We did not call them Majorana before, but they were essentially the very same. But let us just imagine that we don't have a superconductor that has attractive interactions driving uh, spin triplet superconductivity, but we want to take conventional superconductors with some other conventional material, put, that to, put them together, and create an unconventional su superconductor. So just uh, as a reference, let us just think that we take first a van der Waals for a magnet, so and in particular, a system that has out-of-plane magnetization, and this can be uh, chromium tribromide, chromium triiodine, or many other other uh, out of plane ferromagnets that we have in the Van der Waals world, mm -hmm. and then uh, we take a conventional two dimensional superconductor. It can be naive diselenide, it can be uh, tantalum disulfide, naive sulfide, or any other superconductor that you can think about, and we just create a heterostructure like this one. So superconductor and ferromagnet in the bottom. Now the basic idea is, is the following. So what we are going to do now is to slowly switch on every single ingredient of the Hamiltonian that this system has. So if we go back to the structure, we can realize that we have many ingredients here. So of course, in the Van der Waals superconductor, we have kinetic energy for electrons. Then we also have spin orbit coupling because there's mirror symmetry breaking here in this interface. So we are going to have Rashba spin orbit coupling of course, the superconductor is also going to have superconductivity. And the ferromagnet is, of course, also going to create an exchange field on the electrons in the superconductor. So those, uh, those are the four ingredients that we are going to consider. So first of all, let us just consider how the electronic structure looks like if we have just Rajva spin orbit coupling. So yeah, here, yeah, this should be only kinetic energy and spin orbit coupling. So no superconductivity, no exchange. So if you just have Rashba spin orbit coupling, then what you actually get in momentum space is that there's a spin dependent momentum splitting, uh, spin splitting in the Brillouin zone. And this is something that comes directly from Rashba spin orbit coupling. This kind of perturbation does not break time reversal symmetry. It only gives rise to a spin momentum locking in the reciprocal space. Now, if you add exchange field, so now we have kinetic energy, exchange field, and a spin orbit coupling. What you actually see is that this crossing that we originally had becomes an anti-crossing. And this anti-crossing is driven by the exchange coupling. So the bigger the exchange coupling, the bigger the anti-crossing. 
And now the interesting idea is that once you are in this situation, you can kind of think that here you have helical states, right? Because electrons on the left propagate uh, are up and electrons on the right are down and they propagate in opposite directions. So this kind of electronic structure realizes a two-dimensional helical gas. And if you now proximatize a two-dimensional helical gas to a superconductor, you essentially get topological superconductivity. So in particular, if you now include both kinetic energy exchange, rush of spin orbit coupling, and superconductivity, you end up with this type of electronic structure. And now this gap here that you obtain is a topological gap. And let me emphasize that in this Hamiltonian, there's no P-wave superconductivity. The only superconductivity that we put here is S-wave. It's just the superconductivity of niobium diselenide. It's just the superconductivity of a conventional superconductor. But when you combine all the ingredients together, when you combine this spin momentum locking coming from right spin orbit coupling with the exchange field, you essentially generate effectively a P-wave superconductor. And the consequence uh, of this is essentially that you will have edge states. But before showing you the edge state, le let me just summarize what is the idea. You start with Rajva spin orbit coupling, you open a gap, this gives rise to helical states, and afterwards, when you introduce a superconducting order, those helical states give rise to a topological superconducting state. So essentially, the idea is that if you look at strip of this superconductor that you engineered with these two-dimensional materials, you will see a full gap in the bulk and gapless edge states at the edges. And in particular, in one edge, they propagate in one direction, and in the opposite edge, they propagate in the other direction. And in this case, you just have, let's say, one state per edge. So this is what it's called a topological superconductor with Chur number equal to one. But what is interesting is that you are not limited to that. So just by changing the chemical potential of your electronic structure, you can create many different types of unconventional superconductors using all the time the very same ingredients, using all the time exchange coupling, rush spin orbit coupling, and superconductivity. So if you take, for example, a triangular lattice and you put the chemical potential somewhere else, what you actually obtain is a topological superconductor with chair number three. And the uh, let's say schematic is essentially the very same as before. And now you can see that you have chair number three because when you take a strip, you have three edge states, three states per edge. So here, right is top edge, blue is bottom edge. So if you count the state, you have one, two, and three for the uh, but, uh, for the top edge, and one, two, three for the bottom edge. So in other words, the chair number that it's a quantity that we can define from the many body wave function in the Brillouin song essentially tells you how many topological edge states you have, and in particular, how many Majorana channels you have when you have a finite system. And then the last important thing is that, of course, there's a transition between a conventional superconductor to an unconventional superconductor as you switch on the exchange coupling. So in the absence of exchange coupling, you must have a conventional superconductor because you, you started with an s wave superconductor. So you start with a conventional superconducting gap, and as you switch on the exchange coupling, you see that there's one state in your band structure that starts closing and closing the gap, and eventually the gap reopens. So all these cases here are conventional superconductors, so they don't have edge states. And then after you went through the gap closing by increasing the exchange field that is essentially controlled by your van der Waals coupling, then you enter in the topological superconducting regime. And the basic idea is that if you follow this very same evolution, in the strip. So you take a finite strip of this material and you start increasing the exchange coupling more and more and more. You see that in the absence of exchange, you just have your conventional superconductor with no edge states whatsoever. And now you start increasing the exchange more and more and more. And eventually you close your gap and you develop chiral edge states. And in particular, three edge states in the top, three edge states in the bottom. And this is, of course, something that we will also do in the exercise session. All right, good. So this is everything that I wanted to tell you today. So just uh, as a reminder,
uh, we will have the exercise session at uh, one. And the basic idea is that we will take another uh, notebook, now the notebook for session two, which is about superconductivity. And again, as yesterday, you will have examples of how to compute many different systems. And then with these examples, you have to answer a few questions. Some of the questions uh, require you to discuss with each other or, and others to modify the code and do some calculations. So yeah, this is essentially everything on my side and see you at one. I have one question. Uh, maybe you want yeah. to elaborate for you, Mariana, about the conductivity. Yeah, that, that's a, a very good question. So of course, one of the technological uh, motivations for looking for Majoranas is that uh, in principle, one can build something called a topological quantum computer with them. What this actually means is that you can encode quantum information on the many body wave function of a system that has several Majoranas. And by moving the Majoranas around each other, you are capable of doing computations. Now, one of the main advantages of this type of idea is that if you have a superconductor, you have a gap. And in principle, your quantum information is protected by this gap. So if your Majoranas are far enough from each other, in principle, you would not have the coherence effects and your quantum information would not deteriorate uh, with time. So if one is capable of isolating Majoranas and of braiding them around each other, then one would have a scheme to create a topological quantum computer with them. This is, of course, uh, something that uh, it is still a very active area. So there's no topological quantum computer yet, but that has this has been one of the motivations from the uh, technological point of view of these topological superconductors. Great, great. So then, yeah, see you at one then. <laughs>